okay. Now, first of all, Ken, I want to get into this hip-hop fraternity, man. Can you break that down to me? What it's all about and how many lives are y'all changing and saving at the same time? Well, the hip-hop fraternity is a networking organization, and our sole purpose is to bring African-Americans together. But we do accept other ethnic groups, but primarily it's African-Americans because they're the one who basically are the culture they are the ones who produce the music. Mm -hmm. But t typically what happens is you have other people, other groups, other ethnicities, other ethnic groups that get involved, and they end up being the uh, beneficiaries of the culture. Yeah. And so what we're saying is, look, it's our culture, our call. You know, we're independent. You know, we want a, a significant amount of the proceeds. Yes, sir. We don't want to just keep getting these pennies on a dollar yeah. while other people I live in fat off the hog. So our primary purpose is to disrupt that whole industry, that whole thing that's going on where artists is getting actually 15 cent. Why people who never created any of the intellectual property is receiving 85%. Like I, the analogy that I like to give, if I give you a dollar, brother be high, I say here's a dollar, you know, and it's 100%, it's 100, I'll give you 100 dollars, 100 percent of my intellectual property, you say, okay, I'm gonna give you $15 back and go platinum, you're gonna make $850,000, I'm gonna make $150,000. That within itself is inappropriate behavior. You can't mm -hmm. give somebody 100% of your, 85% uh, of your intellectual property when you was 100% creator of that, of that particular product. So it's important, it's essential that young people understand that at the Hip Hop Fraternity, we teach them about ASCAP, BMI, these performance rights organizations, CSAC, Tune core. Yes, know? sir. We teach them about cryptology. We teach them about blockchain, NFTs, yeah, and yeah. NFC, EPKs. near field communication, EPKs, Copyrights. copyright, because these are the things that really entails the business. It's yep. called the music business. Mm -hmm. You know, the music side ain't number 10%. So you got a whole 90% that you must really acclimate yourself to and understand to its fullest potential and to your fullest potential. What was it that just pissed you off, Ken, and made you say, these boys need the game, and I need to step in here and give it to them? Well, you know, I always make the uh, example of, you know, when I first signed with Simon & Schuster, mm. which is one of the biggest publishing companies in the world, yeah. it was owned by CBS, you know, they got me. Mm. You know, how they got me was, it was one word called revert. So I, I was receiving 15% of my intellectual property, which at that time I thought was cool because they gave me a quarter million dollars. I thought, you know, a quarter million dollars, nobody never gave me a quarter million. I thought this was some, a lot of money, but yeah. I didn't know the book was going to sell that well. Of course they do their due diligence and they research, so they know what it's going to do. <laughs> so when it came time to receive my royalties, I'm like, where's my royalties at? They said, well, you know, it reverted from when it went from the hardback to the paperback, it went to uh, 5%. So now I got to work three times as hard you know, sell three times more books to just to get the royalties that I would have got up under the 15%. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, you know, the, the audio books came out. So when the audio books came out, I said, oh, I see how they play, they pimping. Yeah. I said, so they want to play pimping, now you playing my <laughs> exactly. game. Exactly. So what I did, I said, cool. So I went and I called the guy up there. I said, say, man, look, I want to uh, give you $50,000. I mean, well, I said, first of all, how much you want for the, the uh, rights to the, uh, to the audio book, they said X amount of money. I said, I'll give you 50,000, we negotiated. So I went there, it was a a, meet, a little conference room like this, a little bigger, yeah. and uh, you know I went on the internet, I copy and paste me a contract, I put a Jewish name, Limburg, <laughs> you know, on the uh, on the contract, yeah. and I took it to him, you know, and I, I was talking real fast to him, I said, hey, go to check, I just wanna sign it, you know what I'm saying? I said, you know, you know here's, here's the 50,000, y'all read over it kinda quickly. So they read over it, you know, apparently they didn't catch my little, Glitch, you know, <laughs> and I signed the fifty thousand. I never endorsed it. I flipped the check. I walked out. Yeah. So they called me back and told me. They said, "Say, man, you ain't, you know, you didn't endorse the check." I said, "I don't have to endorse." It. I said, "Did you read the contract?" He said, "Yeah, it says that you." I said, "The fifty thousand be coming off of the proceeds of the audio uh, of the original book." I said, "So once y'all make another fifty thousand, y'all don't have to give me uh, right. no royalties. Yeah. Just take it out of there. I just keep the audio book." And now I got 100% of the audio book. And uh, <laughs> just this month, we sold 19,000 uh, copies of the 19 of the audio book. So, you know, it, you know, it's just understanding the culture and understanding the wave, understanding the mega trends, understanding the analytics and the algorithms and all that stuff that goes on with this new wave and, and this, this fourth industrial revolution, which is the internet. Thanks. So I said, you know, the internet is an equal playing field. So I learned from the game. So now I want to give it to Dutch and give it to, uh, DJ Money Now and Supreme yeah. and 
Boogeyman and Cash and yeah. Spook <laughs> and J Fifth, all of our platinum members. You know what I'm saying? What was it like learning this whole internet game, man? Well, you know, I was on it before everybody else. You remember on Jermaine Dupree's album, I said www.pippiken.com. Come so on was, now. That was 20 years ago. My first, I got my first website in 98. <laughs> Niggas wouldn't even up on. Oh, on Come dollar. on now. Yeah, so I, I, I was way ahead of the curve, you know. Yeah. Because when I was in prison, you know, uh, one of the things you got to do when you to get out is you got to have a good rehabilitation. You know, you got to have, you got to be actually mm -hmm. in the prison program. Yeah. So they offered a a, a a computer course there. Yes, sir. So I had I had some you know some minuscule knowledge of computers. You know, saying so they might come out. My brother he taught me about you know, LOL, you know, the internet and all that stuff. And then, so I just knew then that this was the wave of the future. So I just kept watching it. And at the time I said, well, let me go ahead and get her the curve. And then now that I'm on all these albums, I can uh, I can be light speed ahead of the guys that's in the game because yep. now I'm using this as a marketing tool the same way when I said on 50 Cent video, Pippa Ken said, don't Donald Crown. I could have said McDonald's said, don't Donald Crown them as well. Come on. I could have said Coca-Cola said, don't Donald Crown. So I understood, you know, marketing. Mm -hmm. And I understood that this was going to be the wave. Now, when it came to you creating your books, man, what was that like putting the pimping down into page form and then also hitting them with the audio books at the same time, man? Well, you know... Whenever somebody put a quarter million dollars in your face, you get creative very <laughs> fast. Yeah, it, didn't yeah. take, it didn't take much to motivate me after that point. Yeah. But then, you know, when I go back to my time in prison when I was in the joint, right, I used yeah. to be a part of this, this little clique called the Moore Science Temple, right, yeah. by the Honorable Noble Drew Ali. You know, so we, you know, I used to write the Sunday school lessons, you know what I'm saying? So I write the lessons for the brothers. You know, we had Chris Bloods, GD Vice, so everybody in this little organization, you know, brothers was just trying to, you know, find some kind of solace, you know what I mean? Because we locked up, you know, yeah. we just, so we, we just went that way. That's what a lot of brothers do when they go to the penitentiary, they right. get into, the, you know, the religion and mm -hmm. everything. So that's something that I got into. And so while I was into it and I was really studying, I used to write the Sunday school uh, thing. Then I went to college and, you know what I'm saying? I studied, you know, the five paragraph forms and yes, just very writing skills that I learned. Through, you know, being in, I went to English one on one, English one on two, so I aced all them classes. I got made the dean list, so I was pretty sharp, you know, with picking up knowledge. Thanks. You know, what I'm saying I went the smartest person, but I'm very good at sucking up game. So I sucked up the game, yeah. and I didn't realize that game I was sucking up, you know, would eventually <laughs> come to my doorstep. Exactly, and it did. So when uh, they hired Karen Hunter, who's also she wrote the book. Uh, uh, video Vixen with uh, Corinne Stephan, yeah. you know, you know Superhead, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? She wrote that book with her, so she, they want Simon Schuster, they said, well, she needs to be your co-author, you know? And I was kind of like, have it good, I got somebody <laughs> gonna do all the writing for me. <laughs> so when I started writing and, you know, she was talking, you know, me and her didn't, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't pretty much see eye to eye with mm. the game. She yeah. was a very good writer, but she didn't understand. You mm -hmm. got to say this this way because this means yeah. that. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, not, if I say this way, they're going to think I'm a sucker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I had to interject and say, hey, look here. So finally, I just said, just let me write it. And you do all the grammatical <laughs> correction. You know, if I do any grammar errors, you know what I'm saying? You, you fix it. Yeah. And so fortunately, you know, I was just a good writer. And she said, you know, Ken, you very good. My yeah. uh, publisher, you very good. We didn't find too many faults. Yeah, you know, and I, I really spoke it the way it was. You know, I yeah. talked about it like it was in the streets. You know, it, what really happened. You know, I got a photographic memory, memory like an elephant. So I was able to, you know, kind of tabulate everything that was popping. The forty-eight laws of game, though, Ken. When you were laying that on folks and letting folks know that this is the same thing as the forty-eight laws of power, but I'm about to bring it all the way home for you to be able to understand okay. it and use it and take it to another level. Can you break down some of those principles for me? Well, you got to remember, I didn't learn how to read till I was 21. My God. So I was basically illiterate most of my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the way I looked at it, I was like, you know, wow. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking about it. I'm saying, you know, when I used to read books, I said, man, I wish they'd make this stuff more simple. There's so many big words. Eventually, yeah. I learned, you know, the big words mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So sometimes when you making a move, you got to consider the people that you're making a move on. Thanks. So a lot of times you got to consider your audience. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of things that I was writing, I was like, okay, how can I do make this a dual writing? Meaning that how can I make it for intellectual people as well as laymen? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I, made, I wrote, always write my books a way that a layman can understand it, but yet an intellectual person can understand it. From a philosophical standpoint, though. Yes, sir. So when you deal with the phil the philosophy of the game, you're like, instead of me saying, like I said, I was using the analogy, two, I'll be petty, special sauce, lettuce, pickle, onion, on the 70 bun. That's mm -hmm. the Big Mac 
at McDonald's. That's right. But if you want that Big Mac, you got to go to window one, but you don't get the Big Mac to window two. So mm. even though a person is erudite or a person is e intellectual educated, yeah. they can understand what I'm saying in the same manner. Yeah. But you know, using phil philosophy and breaking it down from a philosophical and a symbolic standpoint, you know, allegorialism, you know, what I'm saying it takes it makes it easier for the person who didn't go and get all the degrees and got all the letters behind their name yeah. to understand exactly what I'm saying. So I try to make it where it's comprehensible to the intellectual yeah. and make it understandable to the layman.